you know, the joke about the rising tide lifts all ships. I think that's really true in private equity. And a lot of people think they're super smart because they put money to work. But we've had a, a, an incredible period of just upward growth over the past 10 years or so. Hi, this is Abhilas J. Kumar, co-founder and managing director of Trust Vista. On today's Trust Vista talk, I'm joined by Luke Fennessy, founding partner of Kissel Capital, a newly formed independent sponsor. Luke, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's a great opportunity for me to be speaking with you at this point in time, as you've just recently launched Kissel Capital within the last six yeah. months. But prior to that, you had a nearly 18-year career uh, in a single firm doing private equity. Can you maybe Rewind and talk to me about your journey, where you started in this industry, how you've seen it evolve, and, and then we'll get to why you think this is the time to do something new. Yeah, no, happy to uh, do that. And again, thanks for having me uh, today. I really do appreciate it. Um, so I, uh, my, I'll go career kind of post-college. Uh, so I, I graduated from Indiana University in the late 90s and uh, joined up with an investment banking firm called A.G. Edwards & Sons. It was a middle market focused firm and uh maybe we can talk uh, about my uh you know background before then but um at, at ag edwards uh, we focused on middle market companies and um also then at that point in time learned about the private equity industry and so i was pretty fortunate uh, 2001 just after the dot-com bust to get into the industry uh, where i worked for a group called prospect partners in chicago and uh, that really set my career uh, path in private equity. So, uh, you know, I've been in it for over 20 some years now. And uh, after going back to University of Chicago for grad school, I started up with HKW in uh, 2004 and uh, spent, it was actually almost 19 years there at the firm and great place. Um, uh, you know, I was uh, part of our, uh, the first institutional fund was HKW2. And so I, I spent funds two, three, four, and five at HKW. And, uh, you know, my role there was uh, eventually lead transaction partner. So it was a really great place to uh, to learn the industry. Uh, I was mentored by some some really some great people, some excellent mentors, and, uh, you know, just, just learn the business there. Yeah. And, you know, you use the word private equity industry. At the time you joined private equity. It was barely an industry. Can you maybe talk about how you've seen it evolve over the last couple of decades? Yeah, that's a great observation. I think um, a lot of financial service industries, I mean, they evolve over time, right? And private equity is no different. Um, when I joined in the you know early 2000s, um, especially in the lower end of the middle market, there uh, th it was a competitive advantage to have a fund. And you know a lot of of uh, investment banking firms or even smaller business brokerage firms, um, you know you had you had sort of independent sponsor models of folks running around, but it was more family office kind of professionals, and then um, you know folks that maybe would do a deal here or there. So if you actually had a fund, uh, you had quite a competitive advantage back then. Uh, the industry's clearly evolved and uh, to the point now where I think it's come full circle for independent sponsors, where if you have the experience um, and the the relationships and the connections, you don't necessarily need that fund like you did 20 years ago to be successful. So, um, you know, as far as industry changes, there's um, with any more mature industry, you know, there's there's been some positives and some negatives, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot more, I would say, social pressure uh, on the industry. I think LPs have a have a heavier hand in terms of what firms invest in, if they're going to give them their money to invest. And uh, there's a lot more regulatory pressure as well. So, um, you know, it used to be you could focus on on deals only. And, you know, especially as you become uh, more senior in the firm, there's a lot of other considerations that go into making an investment that um, you don't have necessarily in, in an independent sponsor model. It's one of the reasons I, you know, eventually, uh, you know, left and had formed Kissel Capital for, for some of those reasons. But it, it's definitely gone through a lot of changes, both good and bad. You know, one of the 
exchanges I've kind of witnessed over the last 20 years, having started my career in middle market private equity as well, is once upon a time, folks chase smaller deals thinking that end of the market was more inefficient. Um, now, lower middle market is not a stepchild so much anymore in private equity, and there's a number of folks focused on it. How, how do you perceive uh, that end of the market as relative to the larger private equity world as far as the opportunity set? Well, I, I definitely think there's um, the most opportunity in that segment of the market. Um, you know, there are there are funds, uh, you know, de- regardless of, of, you know, how you classify or characterize the industry. A lot of a lot of folks look at EBITDA size ranges because that's where, you know, firms will come in and set their minimum. So uh, how I think about that lower end of the middle market is, you know, pretty much anything up to, you know, probably probably 10 million or so in EBITDA. So that's kind of the range how I define it. And everybody's going to be a little different in that. But uh, I think there, there, well, first of all, there's a lot more opportunities there. Um, I, what I look for, um, you know, at Kissel Capital now, we can talk about that a little bit later, are uh, specifically I'm looking for management teams that have an, an opportunity to buy the companies that they work for from a founder. And so, you know, what that means is I'm often the, the first institutional capital into a company, whereas as you get larger, you, you've you've had institutional capital in there before. And so it's just, uh, you know, some of the dynamics that, that make for, uh, you know, what could be an attractive deal don't necessarily exist as you go upstream, right? So I, I do think the markets, um, I think they're more efficient than people think. The investment banking community does a really good job of marketing those companies. But um, I think there are dynamics that exist in certain of those assets that that I look for, right? So if you if you have a founder that that you know is going to sell the business, but they're concerned about who the buyer is, um, those situations for me, I, I target those because I think it, it the uh, the valuation becomes more about you know, just the price only, and they factor in other considerations like what's this, what's this firm going to do with the management team? That you know, oftentimes that founder is living in the same community as the team, so they don't want to be known as the sellout, right? That uh, sold and you know has the big boat and the big house on the corner, and you know the rest of the team gets fired and they move the the company somewhere else. So um, I look for those situations, and I think it's. You know, you still have to pay a fair price for whatever the asset is, but um, it does give you a way to compete uh, versus, you know, as you get upstream, it's just, it's much harder to do that. So when we think about value creation, once upon a time, you could focus on just buying cheap, but, you know, you point out rightly, you, you have to pay a fair price, right? And and now there's a greater emphasis on value creation. Yeah. And in founder operated business, i Often there are a lot of areas for what you might call low hanging fruit for value creation, but from a timeline to create that value, increasingly it's not just five years. There's value to be created for a much longer period. How do you perceive the traditional five year hold of private equity in, in the world today? Yeah, well, <laughs> so I, I I'm used to wearing both hats, right? So I I can talk from a funds perspective of you know, why that's um, important, right? It, it's, it's, it gives everybody a goal. You, you work to accomplish the goal. And then that whole period, um, you know, lets you uh, take advantage of the hard work within a defined period of time. And uh, that's also coincides when, when an LP typically wants their money back after they've invested in a committed fund. On the independent sponsor side, um, I, I wear a different hat, right? In that, um, oftentimes, especially the, the investments that have done really well um, in the private equity world, in the what I'll call the committed fund world, there's a lot of pressure to uh, to to make a realization there, right? To put some points on the board, and you get into this um, dynamic of okay, go out, find good companies, drum a little, get an investment return, and now you you go sell it, but then you have to turn right back around and uh, go try to find the next one and repeat that cycle over and over again um it's it can wear you down and you know from doing that for 20 years it certainly uh you know weighed on me um the nice and the advantage of doing an independent sponsor model is you don't have that defined hold period where you have to return that capital back to your investors and so it gives you the ability to um 
uh, really put in strategic planning for, you know, different periods of time, right? So you have more of the shorter term. Um, here's here's the things that we need to do, um, you know, in, 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 in conjunction, obviously, with the team. Uh, in the short run, medium run, and then the long term, here's here's who we want to be. And it gives you the ability to um, to enact on all those strategies uh, over time. And, and you're not really forced to say, hey, let's pick the two or three that we can accomplish within this two or three year hold window that we're going to do. So I do think, again, there's advantages to both. And um, some some owners, some management teams like that shorter quick cycle because it's a way to kind of harvest their returns and move on uh, from a from a longer term hold period. I think especially when you find good companies, um, you're not you're not there's not that constant wheel of turning it. Right. So you can continue to grow and improve and watch the, the you know, the results of uh, some of the hard work that you put in on those earlier years. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I think um, you, you can be successful in both models. I think the independent sponsor model works well for that longer term hold period, at least the way I'm I'm looking at the world. And that's what excites me about uh, what I'm doing at Kissel Capital. Yeah, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't necessarily so common for a private equity firm to exit to another private equity firm. Right? And that's yeah. increasingly common these days. So, you know, it definitely does beg the question, you know, why exit a good asset if it's a good asset? Right. And, it's again and the reasons I, you know, like you described often they're structural right not necessarily commercial yeah that's right i mean you know from and again it's I, i'll talk from a committed fund perspective the the life i used to be involved with um you know it's not it's not company by company you really do have to manage to a fund and your investors have given you capital not for a specific asset but it's for that fund. And so you have to be cognizant of the different investments and how it could potentially influence the returns of the overall fund. Whereas the independent sponsor model, it is unique. Um, and, and I think a, a very positive because if you're on an asset that's really doing well and you want it to grow, you can stick with it and, and really, you know, continue to develop and grow the team and, you know, strategies, um, you know, they'll change over time too. Right. And so it lets you evolve and work with the team and, um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the hardest when you can find a really good company that you enjoy working with, the people are great. Um, it's really hard to have to, you know, to turn it in the traditional sense. It's one of the things I really didn't like about being in that committed fund world is you, you, you work really close with teams, you build really strong relationships. And then when you sell, you, you maintain those relationships, but it's just, you know, it's hard and, and you have to go find the next one. Um, so it is, uh, it's different, you know, in, in, in the independent sponsor model, which I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, and when you think about the power of compounding, you spent nearly 19 years in one organization, obviously that lets you grow your career in a certain way versus if you had switched your job every three, four years. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So it would seem to make sense from an investment perspective as well as if you're able to have a longer horizon, you should be able to do things that others can and make it into a competitive advantage. No, I think I, again, I think uh, I think that's right. Um, I, I do think there's a advan- I mean, I don't want to poo poo that model. I do think, um, you know, one of the things that you have to be cognizant of um, in the industry is just the overall economic cycle. Right. And as a as a long only investor, um, you know, regardless whether you're an independent sponsor or committed fund or not, um, you have to be cognizant of where you're at and you have to have an opinion about where you're at in the cycle. And so, you know, sometimes like and I'll use an example, if you're a capital equipment manufacturer and uh, you invest early on in that sort of next cycle. So if you put money into a CapEx equipment company in early 2010 and 11, um, it's okay to sell it in 2017 or 18 because it's likely that the market's going to turn down. And, um, you know, again, you can't go short that because you're a long only investor. So I do think you have to be, you have to, whether you're in a committed fund or not, I still think you have to be cognizant about where you're at in an economic cycle and how that can impact your investment returns. Um, I would say over time, committed funds have gotten more uh, tuned into that and look for business models that are less cyclical in nature. Those are the assets that typically get bid up. And, um, you know, so if you are 
in that kind of asset, then you're not as as worried about the, the business cycle. So that might apply. So it really, it also kind of depends too on the type of investments you're making. And you just have to be aware of what you're doing and, and have an opinion on on things like business cycles when you're making those investments. That's interesting. You talk about business cycles. Obviously, you started your career right in the dot-com bubble era yeah. and, then, and then came out of B-School and and joined Kissel and when markets were or joined uh, HKW and markets were picking up, but then made partner yeah. right in the middle of the financial crisis. And there really yeah. hasn't been a cycle until more recently. Things have been only going in one direction for nearly 15 years, you know, exception for yeah. the, for a few months of COVID. But um, what's your view on cycles now going forward? Like, will we ever yeah. have well, another I, 15 year run of good times in our lifetime? Is money going to be free ever <laughs> again? I'm, I love this topic. Um, because we can always, uh, you know, you can never be wrong, right? Like ask an economist, uh, whatever that joke is, about when the next recession is, and they'll, you know. Um, but no, I, I love the topic of business cycles, and I, I think, especially like when I started my career, uh, you're right, it was during the dot com bust, and then, you, you know, when I joined at uh, Prospect Partners, I mean, they had a really good portfolio, but they had their share of companies that they had to work through. Um, and I think it's, it was a great time for me, uh, to learn the business and to see, uh, not the upside of what can happen, but actually the downside of what can happen. And it really, uh, I think molded the, the viewpoint that I have about how you make, um, you know, money in the industry. And my focus is on the downside. It's not on the upside, um, you know, one of the partners at Prospect, uh, they kind of joked, but they said, you know, the growth rates, we didn't care about what was in the uh, book. And again, of course, this is 20 plus years ago, but, you know, we we did a lot of our models at, at a 3% growth rate, uh, constant margins. And, you know, the joke was if, if it grows more than that and we can make money at 3%, we're going to do really well. And uh, so the focus was really more on the downside. And when you when you model through and you're in an economic downturn and you're you're having to work through those down downside situations, it really it opens your eyes up to what can happen. I think that was really a, a core part of my learning early on is having experienced some of that. And then you're you're very observant. Um, you know, we we got things going. Uh, there started to be some some upside when I joined at HKW and then voila, we hit another downturn. And, um, and so at one point in my career, I think I had spent more time in downturns uh, in this P industry than upturns, but I'll tell you, it really did. Um, it opened my eyes to, um, and I think it was a really valuable lesson as to, you know, the bad things that could happen. The other thing it did though, I, I would say is it, it, it helped me understand the point I made earlier about we're long only investors. And so you you have to you have to have an opinion about where you're at in the cycle. And if you look back over the last 20 years in private equity, funds that put the bulk of their money to work after that economic cycle that happens are the ones that do the best. And so, you know, the joke about the rising tide lifts all ships, I think that's really true in private equity. And a lot of people think they're super smart because they put money to work, but we've had a, a, an incredible period of just upward growth over the past 10, 10 years or so. And I do think that's going to come back to haunt some folks, especially the more recent funds where, you know, this concept of pay whatever you want, um, you know, you don't make your money on what you buy. And I, I just don't agree with that. I never have. I know you can you know, people leverage down and, you know, try to buy less expensive companies and bring their mul the multiple down and they bring in, you know, the, the growth initiatives and operating initiatives and that, and that all exists. But fundamentally, we're long only investors and it, it does matter what you pay for an asset. I've always believed that. And, and the reason is that downside risk, right? Because if you overpay in the beginning and you, you hit the, the next skids too quickly, you can be in big trouble. And so I just I think. I've always had that's one of the core things I look for and think about in any investment I make is where we're at in that business cycle. And look, I'm not right either all the time. I mean, we we were we were thinking, uh, you know, that the, the next cycle is coming in 2018 and, you know, probably missed out on some opportunities there that we were just concerned about the cyclical nature of those investments. But 
um, you know, it's, uh, and so it took a lot longer than we thought to hit the next cycle, but I do think we're here. And I think right now is a great time to put money to work too. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, no, I would agree with you that, you know, downturns can be very educational if you can stomach it. Um, and, you know, when you're more junior in your career, it can, you know, seem distressful. But if you don't experience a downturn until you're much further along in your career, it's even more harrowing when you've got a lot of real life <laughs> responsibilities. Right? right. And so knowing that this can happen does shape you as an investment professional. I think folks who've started after the financial crisis, there's a lot of emphasis on how good they are at raising capital or sourcing deals. And there's a lot less emphasis on how good are you at helping those investments become better investments. Right? Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with folks who've never had to deal with this before and have no idea how to hold management teams accountable because they've never had to have those type of conversations. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, there's a lot of truth to that. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, this period of time, um, I mean, and look, there, you know, people benchmark too so you can always point to our returns aren't as good but the benchmark isn't good either so you, you there are ways to kind of skirt around it but more yeah, fun than all that is when you do well it's you and when you do poorly it's the markets right <laughs> exactly right yeah yeah but i think you're right in, ter in terms of you know things have been going really well for a long time and uh you know covid was a little definitely it impacted some businesses you know um, but but again, there, you know, it was COVID and everybody blamed it on COVID. And, um, you know, and since then, I mean, you, 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 you still have to be able to, um, you know, have an opinion about the team. And, and, and you know, just that's kind of what, um, you know, where, where and everyone has a different strategy around how they work with management teams. Right. And so for for my whole career. Um, you know, I, I've always taken this mantra of, hey, I'm I'm an investor. I'm not an operator. Right. Um, if I'm in there running a business, we're probably in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, that's not what I do well. Right. I try to I try to uh, assess talent and make sure the right people are, are, you know, not to steal the good to great term, but it's to make sure the right people on the bus are in the right seats. And we're, we're plowing forward with the strategy that we all agree on. And you have to have an opinion about how the market's influencing that versus how the team's doing. And that's that can be some of the hardest things is just, you know, recognizing when you're wrong and when you have to make change. And I think that, um, you know, whereas some people are just going to make the mistake, the business isn't performing, so you got to get rid of the team and, and maybe not taking a broader perspective that, hey, this market is – it is what it is, and maybe you picked the market wrong and the investment wrong, and the team's actually doing pretty well. So there, there is a lot of that's where perspective and I think experience comes, comes in quite a bit when when you're facing those decisions. Yeah, there's no substitute for time sometimes in learning this industry. Speaking about time, 19 years nearly at HKW, and now you've launched a Kissel. What was the catalyst? Why now? Yeah, I mean, there there's a lot of reasons. I think, um, you know, first of all, when you when you're anywhere for 19 years, um, you know, there's just there's a lot of changes. And, you know, there's I, I developed some really great relationships with a lot of folks there and, um, you know, really enjoyed it. Again, I was around the committed fund business for funds two, three, four, five. And so, um, you know, it's it was a lot of fun. I think. Um, I think COVID, I mean, there are a number of things that that ultimately kind of influenced it. Um, and, uh, you know, as as well as what I would consider kind of work work life balance things that are really important to me as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I had always in the back of my mind had had this vision of, you know, what the second part of my career might look like. And, and as I say, I kind of take the best practices from the private equity industry and then leave the TPS reports to others. That's an office space reference, um, the TPS reports there. So uh, I felt like I've learned a lot. I've had great mentors over the years, which I think is really important in this industry. And I felt like I could create something that was was unique. And um, we haven't really talked about my my childhood or my upbringing at all, but I spent a lot of time in a blue collar environment. So for me, um, you know, going back and focusing on industrial service companies where you do have a lot of blue collar type workforce and knowing that I can help people like that, um, help the management teams, you know, do something that is pretty cool, 
part of the American dream um, and, and be part of something like that and just really help people. To me, it was really exciting. And, um, and uh, you know, knowing that people are thankful uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, to me, that, that was really exciting and appealing. And that's, that's one of the main drivers. I think, too, I mean, I was fortunate I had an opportunity to make an investment um, and, and got something closed even before I formed Kissel Capital. So that helped set up the groundwork to be able to do what I'm doing now. And I was really fortunate in that, that regard too. But um, that's ultimately the the impetus of, uh, you know, getting Kissel Capital off the ground. And as a side, can I ask you, where did you get the name? Kissel Capital. <laughs> well, you know, like all good private equity firms, um, if you look around, they usually name themselves after the street that they're on um you know or uh you know street names or maybe roman gods or whatever but um you can't see it but if i looked outside of my office window here uh, i live out in the country and the road is uh called kissel road and so um <laughs> kissel capital is uh, effectively kissel road now yeah. not to get real deep but um Kissel Road is no longer Kissel Road. It's now South 775 East <laughs> uh, because of the uh, fire department needing to upgrade. So my my view on Kissel is I'm kind of going back to old school private equity and doing kind of the things that I was doing 20 years ago, you know, back at uh, really at Prospect Partners back when they were doing it that way. And it's the same thing with Kissel Road, you know, people around uh, where I live, still know it as Kisser Road, and there, there's a fondness towards that name versus the new name. So that's kind of the history of, of Kissel Capital. And as an entrepreneur, now you're more than just a private equity investor. You're running a business as well. How, how has that been a new experience for you? You know, it's been, it's really been uh, it's really been a lot of fun, um, and uh, I've never experienced it before. So you know, my my role. Really, in, at, at HKW and, um, you know, even before that, it was to fly around the country and I, I'd say I'd make wealthy people like uber wealthy, right? And these are entrepreneurs for the most part that have done really well. And, um, but I, you know, so you know them, but you don't really understand as much what they've gone through. And I feel like this this experience for me uh, has been really eye opening. You know, it's, it's things as simple as how do you create a brand? How do you create marketing content? Um, how do you set up your IT system? Um, you know, all those things are already done and, you you know, you, you kind of just signed up to your computer and everything worked. But when you do it yourself, um, it, it's really, you know, it creates uh, it's I found it's a lot of fun to be able to build this. And um, and then, you know, hiring folks like being you know, like having to onboard them and creating processes, which your firm has been really helpful for me in doing that. Um, in terms of onboarding, uh, and then as you expand, you know, the building CRMs out and and how to process those. Um, there's just there's been a lot there, and it's it's been exciting. You know, anytime you build something, that's fun to do. Um, I would say though too, it's a roller coaster, right? Like it's it's not all upside and you know sunshine and, and lollipops. I mean, there's it's there's some there's some pretty severe downs too. And um, you know, I had a friend. Uh, one of my best friends growing up that that had gone through a transition about a year before I did and has been really instrumental in just helping me kind of, um, you know, with some of these things uh, to what to expect. And, and his term was always, it's a roller coaster. And yeah. and that's what it is. You know, there's some ups and, and downs. And what I try to do is really focus on the ups, the positives, and really, I have a hard time historically celebrating wins. So I really try to make an effort when I get a win to celebrate them. And then at the same time, you know, when you have those down days, um, I just try to turn the page and forget about them. I know there's probably better <laughs> strategies for that, but um, you know, I don't, I don't like to focus on those. I think that's not who I want to be or who this firm's going to be. And so I just choose to turn the page and forget about them. And, you know, again, that's that's what's worked for me. But it's been a lot of fun is what I would say. Yeah, well, you know, in private equity, we focus on the J curve and where we're going to be at the exit. Right? But, you know, when you're a private equity investor, it's just capital. You can check in quarterly and do valuations. But when you're the operator living it, you can still care about where you're going to be in five years. But you got to live the day to day ups and downs. And that's a very different emotional experience. 
Yeah, I mean, there's no question. It's, uh, you know, and, and I think everybody takes probably a little different approach when they're first starting the firm. I mean, again, my background, um, I, you know, it's sort of Midwestern, very conservative. So I, I, I'm fully bootstrapped. I, I don't, you know, until I have the appropriate level of management fees coming in, um, I don't want to hire folks. Right. And so it's, it's, uh, you know, I've used your team for that regard, right. To, to be able to flex up and down as I've needed, uh, you know, talent and, uh, resources there. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm now getting to that point where I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, hiring some folks and it's, it's, you know, it's just the strategy I've chosen. Other other folks might go raise some money from investors and get going. I just didn't choose that 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 path. So, um, you know, for me, I'm comfortable in that bootstrap, work hard, get it done kind of uh, environment, and I feel like I strive in it. And so I've I've enjoyed this quite a bit. And as you pointed out, a lot of the companies you invest in, you're the first institutional capital. So for you to go through this journey this way, it probably gives you a much higher level of connection and empathy for the entrepreneurs you're trying to partner with. Yeah, it does. And and I think it's, um, you know, everyone has their, their talents of what they bring to an investment, right? I, I've always been more of the, on the deal related side, uh, purposely not gotten into real deep, like operational strategies and initiatives. But, you know, I think especially around systems and processes and CRMs and things like that, you know, just having n- now knowing, not only what they are and how they work, but like creating my own KPIs and, you know, developing my own, um, you know, reports and engagements and all the things you can do through a CRM. And then, you know, when you see it at a company, you can talk more meaningful on how you can apply that in the business. And again, I I don't want to say that I, I mean, I knew all the basics, but, you know, had I ever gone into HubSpot and created, I used the, the CRM HubSpot, but, you know, whether it's Salesforce or any of them, I've just always asked people and had people do those reports or do, you know, but like you, there is no one. So like you have to, you know, you use you guys or you help you, you do it yourself. And so I, I feel like it just, you know, it helps you understand how they all work better. And then obviously then that helps you uh, when you when you when you're helping a company think through things. Um, you know, you can be more resourceful there. So I, I do agree. It's it's definitely helpful to have gone through some of this. Yeah. And with lower middle market companies or even startup firms, historically, you know, there's a lot of lower hanging fruit you could pick to try to create value. Right. But in yeah. this more competitive world, uh, you've really got to think about how does IT processes, how do you punch above your weight at all times? Yeah, yeah no, it's. Um, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. And I, I, here's what I would say, like everyone's unique in their strategy and how they approach an investment. And so when I, um, it really starts in due diligence and, um, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, over the years we've developed different process, uh, uh, different processes on evaluating a company's internal processes. And, uh, during due diligence, you usually, you look for, uh, you know, best practices and areas of improvement. And I've always been of the the opinion that you got to, uh, you know, our our strategy and my strategy at Kissel is always a partnership approach to management. It's not a, a uh, you know, command and you, you will do kind of persp- uh, approach. So um, I identify things uh, even later today. I'm, I'm going to be on a call where we're going to walk through a number of things with this uh, prospective uh, company I've got under a letter of intent right now. And we're walking through these different processes and we're going to identify areas of, you know, potentially weakness or, you know, things that are OK. And those then get added to a, um, a plan. And so, you know, I uh, earlier I'd mentioned like my approach is um, post-closing you do strategic planning. You re, you in some cases you re what you've already agreed to during the process of hey here are the two or three major growth strategies you're going to go achieve. But then you also look at all of your due diligence initiatives and you identify hey you know for example our sales force isn't really uh, structured in a way that's that's producing the results that we want. And so um, we have uh, and over time have developed relationships with. Uh, firms that can come in and be real specific in those areas. So whether it's HR, whether it's Salesforce, 
um, you know, enhancements, engagements, whether it's IT, whether it's financial, um, you develop a Rolodex of firms that can come in and then help those companies if they need the help, right? Um, some some firms just have a playbook and say, "Hey, we're coming in, and you're gonna you're gonna get behind all these initiatives, and we're gonna create this this great business." That works. It's just not my strategy. I I really like to work with the teams and figure out where their pain points are, and then you know sometimes that doesn't align with where I can be helpful either. And and those aren't investments I make, right? So you you have to know um, how the business fits within what you can bring strategically. And if it's a, a, you know, for example, if it's a company that needs a ton of operational improvements, then I'm probably not the right person. And guess what? That's totally okay. I'm okay with that. Like move on and find something that's a better fit for me and it'll probably be a better fit for them too. So uh, I, I look for them. I, you know, I know what I can improve on and and then I know it's going to take a lot of work too, unfortunately. And sometimes you you pass over situations that you think might be too much work for you know, the return that you might get or the resources that you have to to put after it. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Super excited for you as you start this new chapter in your journey and looking forward to maybe doing one of these again in a couple of years and seeing you reflect on how it's gone and where we are in the cycle then. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for having me. Take care. Mm-hmm.